Good morning. Thank you for joining Ground Control Updates from the Field, the second in a series of webinars that is providing reports on the progress of New York State's carbon farming pilot study. My name is Andy Bicking, Director of Government Relations and Public Policy for Sina Hudson, and I will be your host. This program is sponsored by Sina Hudson, the Northeast Carbon Alliance, the New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets, the New York State Soil and Water Conservation Committee, and the Dutchess County Soil and Water Conservation District. The first half of the event will begin with a pre-recorded update from Assembly Member D.D. Barrett, the visionary behind this study, followed by comments from New York State Commissioner of Agriculture and Markets, Richard Ball, Sina Hudson President, Ned Sullivan, Dutchess County Soil and Water Conservation District Executive Director, Brian Skorlick. After hearing from these speakers, we will watch three previously unreleased videos of farmers participating in the pilot study. The second half of the program is a question and answer session with our speakers and two farmers who are currently participating in the study. Please prepare your questions. You can leave them in the Q&A comment box at any time, but we'll wait until the second half of the program to answer them. It's now my great pleasure to introduce you to Assemblywoman Dee Dee Barrett. Hi, I'm Assemblymember Dee Dee Barrett and welcome to Ground Control Updates from the Field, the second in a series of webinars that are providing an update on the Hudson Valley Carbon Farming Pilot Project. This project is very important to me and one that I feel has great promise to inform policy and practice for New York State and the nation and possibly across the globe. My own policy work on carbon farming began in 2017, first with legislation and then funding in the state budget to create this pilot study. I was inspired by farmers in my district who are doing important game-changing work to greatly improve the health and productivity of our farmland, while at the same time safeguarding water quality and trapping carbon dioxide and nitrogen oxide to greenhouse gases that are causing climate change. I felt this work needed to be made more visible and widespread. After researching this issue more deeply, I learned that many of the assumptions the state was making about soils were based in Dust Bowl era ideas of what agriculture should be. With the specter of climate change at our backs, we needed to take a broader and deeper look. Agriculture is one of the few sectors of the economy that has the potential to be a net negative emitter of greenhouse gases. It can reduce its own emissions and absorb emissions from other sectors by trapping them in the ground through the natural biology of plants and animals. While I'm excited about this progress that this study is making, there is much more to do. Last year, I worked with my colleague in the assembly, Donna Lupardo, and Senate Agriculture Committee Chair, Michelle Hinchy, to pass the state's Soil Health and Climate Resiliency Act. When signed by Governor Hochul, this bill will put New York State solidly on the path to supporting more farmers in implementing some of the climate saving practices you will hear about today. Today's webinar will focus on the stories of three farmers and farms, Chase Home, Willowbrook and Smiley Farms, all of whom are using diverse strategies to change the way their dairy and or cattle operations are functioning. But the study is much broader, as you'll hear from Brian Skorlick, Executive Director of the Dutchess County Soil and Water Conservation District. It involves 20 Hudson Valley farms in five counties and of varying sizes and production types. Thank you again for being here. And please know that me and my office are here for you if you ever require support in my district. Now it's my great pleasure to pass the virtual microphone to my friend and colleague in state government, Richard Ball. Richard is first and foremost a farmer. He also currently serves as the New York State Commissioner of Agriculture and Markets, but his leadership is quite expansive. He's also chairing the Agricultural and Forestry Panel of the Climate Action Council, which is developing actual actions right here in New York State that we can achieve to implement this important law. Finally, Richard is the president of the National Association of Departments of Agriculture, giving him an important leadership role in shaping climate policy nationwide and internationally. Richard, thank you. Well, gosh, thank you so much, Assembly Member. It's great to see you, at least virtually, and great to be with you all, at least virtually, here today. And uh, thanks for a few minutes here to address you, and I'm looking forward to uh, a pretty meaty agenda here and, and hearing those updates uh, right from the farm. 
We're uh, pretty fortunate in New York State. I think we've got a pretty good head start on, on the effort here. Uh, we probably have the most uh, aggressive climate action plan uh, of any state in the country. And I think that bodes well. I think we've had a head start in, in a number of regards and I'll get that uh, into that in, in just a moment. Uh, the assembly member mentioned uh, our work uh, with the Climate Action Council. Uh, I have to note Ned, Ned Sullivan, you're going to hear from shortly as a member of that group. But, you know, I was fortunate to be able to chair the Ag and Forestry Advisory Panel. A uh, very good group of minds, a uh, thoughtful group, a very diverse group, farmers, researchers, uh, industry leaders, environmental leaders, etc. And we worked to put together a scoping plan for just how agriculture's part and role in this effort uh, to address climate change would happen. And I have to say, uh, we achieved some consensus and had a great amount of conversation, great amount of effort and work. And I think we've come up with a pretty good plan. And now we're joining with our partners on the Climate Action Council, representing the other sectors, you know, transportation, energy generation, waste, housing, et cetera to figure out how we integrate it all in, into a plan for New York State. For us in agriculture, it's, it's pretty neat because I think I mentioned a head start, but you know, we're fortunate to have an agricultural environmental management uh, plan, our AIM plan about managing nutrients and environmental uh, concerns on the farm directly. Uh, we also have climate resilient farming programs. We have ag non-point. We've got a number of programs initiated to start uh, with environmental and water concerns, uh, which have turning into great co-benefits as we deal with greenhouse gases. So I think that's uh, puts us in a pretty good place there. I want to take just a moment to talk about the national picture just a little bit. Didi alluded to my role with the other state departments of agriculture. Uh, that organization of State Departments of Ag has entered into uh, a pretty innovative and uh, progressive group called FACA, the uh, Food and Agriculture Climate Alliance. And it's nonpartisan, uh, includes the Environmental Defense Council, American Farm Bureau, the Council of Ag Co-ops, and of course the State Departments of Ag to, and a number of other organizations to actually look at climate in a bigger way and in a proactive way. I'm encouraged by what's happening there. I'm encouraged by what I'm hearing from Senate leaders like Senator Stabenow about uh, her thoughts on that. Obviously, a Senator from Michigan, we share the same climate, we share the same uh, crop mix uh, as Michigan. So I think her, her experience and her weight on the subject is very important. Um, I'm excited about what I hear from USDA and Secretary Vilsack. Uh, offering up the idea of regional pilot programs. It's been offered to New York, it's been offered to the Northeast. We're very much interested in talking about that uh, because I don't think one size fits all for the whole country. And certainly we're unique in the Northeast in a number of ways. I'm excited that people are already talking about the farm bill. Uh, oh my gosh. Every five years, we have a chance to look at uh, agriculture and, and food and nutrition in a different way. And, I think people are already thinking about uh, how that next bill is going to be written and what needs to be thought about there. And just uh, two weeks ago, I was in Washington and hosted the Tri-National Accord, which is conversations with our trading partners to the north and the ministers of ag there, the secretaries of ag in Mexico and all the commissioners from the US. We talk about a wide variety of issues and. Certainly climate was on top of the list and frequently discussed item. And we've been uh, setting up a meeting uh, just this morning to have discussions with some of the ministers of ag in Canada to discuss water and climate issues, what the US is planning to do and how they might uh, coincide and, and collaborate on that. But back to the state level, I just have to say that uh, again, the good news is we've already begun a number of these projects. Uh, looking forward to hearing about the Hudson Valley uh, update from the farmers. I'm excited about our ag non-point work. I'm excited about the AIM plans. I see them as being integral as we go forward. And we already have some boots on the ground to help us achieve some of these goals with our soil and water conservation districts. 
We're going to need the funding streams. We're going to need the technical expertise that we can provide in that way. So I'm a, I feel generally optimistic. It's a daunting task, but I feel like we have a little bit of a head start, certainly in agriculture, where we can be part of the solution and not just uh, be tasked with limiting emissions, but we can actually sequester carbon as well. So uh, let me stop right there and, and turn it back over to Ned Sullivan with Cena Cousin. Uh, going to talk a little bit about the work with the Northeast Carbon Alliance, which I've had the privilege of uh, spending some time with as well. So over to you, Ned. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, we are all grateful to Assemblymember Barrett for her thoughtful opening remarks today and leadership in crafting and sponsoring state policy supporting climate smart farming. And hats off to Andy Bicking for your pivotal role in this context. And thank you, Commissioner Ball, for your kind int introduction and for your optimism. That's a crucial ingredient at this stage as we tackle the, the climate crisis. Uh, I'm excited about the progress uh, you and the state are making through the Climate Action Council, and it's been an honor to serve under your leadership on the agriculture and forestry uh, panel, and to see your leadership at the state, regional, national, and uh, tri-national levels in moving agricultural policy and programs to support the crucial shift to regenerative practices. By way of introduction, Scenic uh, Hudson preserved, preserves land and farms. We create parks that connect people to the inspirational power of the Hudson River while fighting the threats to the river and natural resources of, of our region. And certainly climate change is the biggest threat we face today. Working closely with farmers in the region, we've protected some 135 farms through conservation easements, and we work to secure policies and funding that support Hudson Valley agriculture. Through science and collaboration, the Northeast Carbon Alliance, a project of Scenic Hudson, brings together land managers, scientists, and public policy experts to in the Northeastern region to uh, realize the great power of natural solutions to combat climate change from mountaintop to ocean floor. We work in the Hudson Valley in New York State and throughout the entire Northeast region and beyond. And we are honored that Commissioner Ball and Assembly Member Barrett have both been actively involved in the Northeast Carbon Alliance. Everyone participating in the Hudson Valley Carbon Farming Pilot should feel proud knowing that this project has captured the attention of scientists and policymakers from the Northeastern states, many of whom are part of the, our alliance. The data and learning from this pilot will help the multi-state region better understand what policies and practices on the ground should be prioritized to support agriculture and address the climate crisis and to help shape regional and national policy. The conversation is particularly poignant as New York State focuses on a just transition to enact the new climate law. And as the federal government begins its work to, to scope out the 2023 Farm Bill, as Commissioner Ball has, has mentioned. We're gonna be involved in that and pushing for that just transition uh, at the regional and national level, as well as in New York State. So as we work to reshape the public policy landscape in these arenas, one thing is clear. All the best ideas in the world to address uh, and implement climate resilient agriculture will only uh, be effective if they can be efficiently implemented on the ground at the local farm level. And New York State under Commissioner Ball's leadership is already leading the way. And we're really fortunate uh, to have one of the most highly developed and regarded systems to deliver technical resources and funding to farmers who are making decisions about how to manage their land. 
That is the remarkable network of soil and water conservation districts in the state, working on the front lines of interpreting science and practice and supporting farmers in their efforts to improve soil health, increase yields, achieve profitability, and be a, a positive force in addressing climate. So uh, we think this is the potential for uh, certainly a regional model and will inform our uh, work at the federal level as well. So with this in mind, it's my honor to introduce the next speaker in the morning's program, uh, the Executive Director of Dutchess County Soil and Water Conservation District, Brian Skorlick. Brian. Well, thank you for that, Ned. Um, good morning, everyone. And um, welcome to this, uh, this event this morning. Um, basically, I'm going to give you a brief rundown of uh, some of the background of the, uh, the farms and the projects that we're uh, working on in the region and uh, uh, identify a few things that we're going to be looking for going forward. Um, briefly, this uh, project has been around for about a year and a half, almost two years now. And um, we have what was previously identified as uh, 20 farms working on the project. Um, in five very uh, different counties. Um, the farms are all diverse in type and size, as well as um, in their location in the Hudson Valley. So uh, there are some very unique uh, characteristics about all the uh, practices and all the farms that we're working with. Um, in saying that, we have uh, later on some videos uh, highlighting some of our dairy uh, operations, but um, we're quite diverse in that we're also working with some uh, orchards, some grain operations, um, some vegetables, both organic and conventional um, operations, as well as uh, some other farm types. Um, so we have quite a quite a mix of, of farmers that we're, we're coordinating with and the practices that they're doing are all unique to their operations and to the uh, farm needs uh, here in the Hudson Valley, which is, uh, as the commissioner mentioned earlier, uh, unique in some respects to uh, agricultural as a whole. So we're, we're working on um, carbon sequestration and soils health in a variety of manners, uh, some being um, uh, some crop rotations and uh, an enhanced uh, grazing um, situations. There are um, forage management systems uh, being implemented to enhance those farms. There are uh, mulching and residue management practices being deployed to see how that uh, will benefit the soil uh, microorganisms as well as the farm uh, erosion control. Um, some simple cover cropping and both basic and multi-species uh, implementation is being utilized. This is to try and enhance the farm's um, footprint and, uh, and, and improve their uh, carbon sequestration, as well as develop a relationship with the farmer in trying new practices and enhancing things that they may have already been uh, performing on their farm. So with those practices, um, the, the project has proceeded by starting off with some planning out and outreach. And then uh, the soils health testing was performed as a precursor to any implementation so that we had a baseline and uh, some, some data sets to work with that would be uh, most useful for the farmer uh, primarily. Um, after the implementation and the uh, development of these practices, the, uh, the farms will, will go through a couple of seasons and there will be uh, follow up soils health testing. And again, this is to evaluate the effectiveness of the practice if, if it's um, identified, as well as really to give feedback to the farmer about those management decisions that they've been making on their farm and to uh, help them develop that confidence in these uh, practices and to um, effectuate change on their farm and also in their community, because uh, these, these uh, producers are generally early adopters 
and they are looked to in their communities as progressive, as uh, influential, and um, we need to, uh, you know, expand these acres. We need to expand the implementation of these practices, but really it's kind of difficult to do that unless you've got some really willing and able um, early initiators to go out there and do the work and to then develop, you know, those relationships with the the, um, the soil and waters uh, offices as well as with their neighbors so that they can um, help them become involved in these soil and conservation practices. Um, so really the, the benefits are, are multiple, um, but the intent is to, you know, develop these soils health practices that are unique for the Hudson Valley in, in their deployment and their implementation, and to learn from these uh, activities how uh, the, uh, the farmers can, can um, develop more um, practices for their farms. So with that, I will turn it back over to Andy. Thanks, Brian. Really appreciate you giving a good bird's eye view of the entire pilot study. It, it's really helpful to keep that context in mind. And I know all of us really appreciate your work, the work of the Soil and Water Conservation Committee at the statewide level, and all of your partners um, and various county-based uh, SWCDs around the region, uh, really doing some amazing work. Uh, so hats off to all of you. Um, as you've heard, the uh, carbon farming pilot involves 20 Hudson Valley farms of various sizes and production types. Today, uh, we're really excited to premiere three videos featuring the experiences of some of these farmers, including Sarah Chase of Chase Home Farms in Pine Plains, New York, Russell Smiley of Smiley Farm in Middletown, New York, and Ken Benneke of Willowbrook Farm in Millerton, New York. Before we share them with you, just one more reminder to please be sure to put your questions for our presenters uh, and the farmers in the Q&A comment box. I'm seeing a few come in now, so thank you for that. Please keep them coming. Following the videos, we'll address, address them. In the meantime, enjoy the show. I'm Sarah Chase from Chase Home Farm. I'm a third generation dairy farmer, but I'm 100% grass-fed, organic. We practice rotational grazing, uh, holistic management. We're managing on our home farm 220 acres with about, at this point, 75 cows. The, the first benefits that you notice when you are rotationally grazing is that you know that you're gonna have grass for your cows. Uh, in a continuous grazing system, the grass can't keep up with the cows. In a prescribed grazing where you're setting up where the cows can and can't go, they only have access to what you give them, so they do a clean job taking down all those plants sort of the same, and then that zone can like regrow and you can count on that grass to come back. We started grazing taller, not turning them into it until the grass was taller than it had been when we were first grazing. And that way we were able to control the amount of energy the cows were getting. It's like they're not only getting protein from this lush grass, which is generally down lower on the plant, they're getting to eat this like higher energy top of the plant, um, you know, photosynthesizing like very green and active forage. And we can take them out to make sure they don't go down below like uh, maybe a six inch residual. Leaving a little more uh, residual helps the plant grow back faster. Carbon is sequestered by the plant photosynthesizing and sending carbon dioxide down into the soil where it is traded with the microbes and through the roots, through the exudates. And we're trying to encourage that relationship to happen more and more and more and more. So I will graze the pasture and mow it down so that the grass is small at in like the fall when when those perennial plants are starting to like cool it a little bit and prepare for winter. And then I will no-till into that sod a heavy rye mix. These have grasses, legumes, and forbs in there. And in the spring, those plants are all gonna grow up and we mow it down so that they're not gonna come back after you know we take a first cutting off the field. They're just they're plants that are like there to contribute to the networks in the soil. We call our system not just like rotational grazing, but I call it adaptive planned grazing because 
It feels really important that the grass managers are responding to weather events. You know, each season is different. How much rain are we getting? How hot is it? How many cows do you have on the pasture? All of those factors are going to change the way you should be grazing at a certain time. This grazing strategy gives you more resilience. It's part of the tool set for yeah, managing a forage-based farm in a time when climate change is like causing all sorts of chaos in the way that we were used to doing things. That does take a real change of management style. That means like spending a lot more human time setting up fences and taking down fences. It means like designing your farm in a different way. But besides the like time and learning, there's not a ton of investment and I think that it like really does pay dividends long term for farm health, animal health, and you know in our case both milk and, and meat quality. I would absolutely endorse some version that works for you of an adaptive grazing plan. We've been cover cropping for most of my life. I can remember even my father was cover cropping. Uh, we milk 40 cows, have about 100 head all together. We grow all our own uh, forages as far as corn, alfalfa, grass, hay. We do quite a bit of cover cropping on the corn on the ground that we uh, chop for silage. We, this year we use straight rye. Other years we've tried some other things like some uh, radishes or turnips, some people call them. Uh, also, as far as cover crop, it's really not a cover crop, but we pick a lot of corn. We're picking 40 acres this year. That's a lot for us. And those stalks stay on the ground, and that helps with the erosion. And uh, it's kind of a cover crop thing, too. You know, uh, overall, you know, the cost of, of cover crop is very low. I did all our cover cropping for a $400 bill this year. It's, it's a nominal thing compared to what you get in return as far as erosion control, green manure, organic matter buildup. We sometimes we bale the straw, and you know, that's a big benefit for bedding baby calves or baby bedding even heifers and cows. It pays off well. Management challenges usually sometimes it's weather related like everything in agriculture. You just got to take the time to have your seed on hand as soon as you get done chopping, get it in as early as you can so you can get a good start you know, before you get cold weather. Cover crops help with carbon sequestration because after the cover crop is terminated, those roots are left in there so that, so that carbon is left in the soil. Um, you know, the less disturbance there is, the less chance that carbon is going to then come back out of the soil. So, you know, it works hand in hand with a no-till type cropping system. We do very little plowing, very little tillage at all. You know, we no-till in the cover crop. We no-till in the corn before that. Uh, we no-till in our seedings as far as alfalfa and grass. So we have fields here that haven't been plowed in 20 years or longer. And you can see it, it, it just the soil health is, is better. You know, you, you got your beneficial soil organisms as the earthworms and the microbials. If you're a farmer and you got some land you want to put cover crop on, I wouldn't hesitate at all. And you can always go to your uh, extension service, you can go to the Soil and Water Conservation District, talk to them, get ideas. You know, there's plenty of stuff online, a lot of resources. Most people who start cover cropping, they don't stop. You know, once you start it and you get into it, it's something they do every year. It's a very beneficial thing and if it wasn't, I think people would just stop doing it instead of gaining acres. Our name of our farm is Willowbrook Farm. It's been here since 1943. I'm third generation, and um, we've been to a dairy farm um, ever since. We have a big waterway that goes through our farm. We have a huge stream bed. The beginning of our swamp is the is the aquifer that runs into the Weebatuck Creek, goes into the Ten Mile and then Houstonic uh, River. The buffer that we're doing um, is in our pasture. We have the fence. Uh, for the streamline to keep the cows out so that the cows aren't running through the, the stream bed and, and going to the bathroom in the stream and, and polluting it with nitrates, phosphorus, um, and so on. That's all complete and then this week we're going to start doing the other steps of planting the fruit trees, the bushes to clean the carbon out of the air, take the nitrates out of the water, filter it, clean the ground up.
hopefully by next year we'll have some fruit growing from the trees that we're planting and um, we can benefit from that also for our farm store. Before the project started to reclaim the stream bed, we had a group of heifers down there and they all just traveled through the, the streams. The traffic of the animals going through the water made it really muddy. So the pasture was always muddy, the cows weren't as clean, and by keeping them out of the stream bed, um, it's actually dried up part of the pasture. There's minimal maintenance in what we're doing. Uh, once the fence is up, there's just some bush hog, um, basic mowing, and then the cows take care of the rest. On a uh, cost value, we haven't had to put in any money. We've worked with the soil and water conservation um, for many years. This is uh, step one of of next five to six years, I hope, of projects, and hopefully it will will benefit and uh, make our farm more efficient, which is uh, the most important thing to keeping us going. <laughs> if you're nervous about doing any sort of, of state government uh, programs um, through the soil and water conservation. Um, don't be afraid to ask any farmer that's involved, including myself. The best way to reach out is to, to go to your farm and home center to your, your local uh, water and soil conservation office to find out what programs are available. By using these programs that the soil and water offers, uh, we can better everything that we use in the farm um, and make it a better place for my kids. Uh, so uh, maybe someday that they'd want to be able to, to be a fourth generation farmer by protecting the land that we, we work every day. That's something to me that means a lot to me. Well, thank you so much for everyone who participated in those outstanding videos. I think they really do give a really strong picture of what's happening out in the field and show some remarkable progress in this study. Uh, we have had a few questions come in on the Q&A feature, so please keep them coming. Um, Commissioner Ball, we're going to start with a, a question to you, if that's all right. Uh, the question is coming from an anonymous attendee, and it is, how do you see the state's role and furthering the understanding of how agriculture can play a role in fighting climate change. And there was a follow-up question to this related to um, what the process might be like and uh, what the interest in the Hopewell administration might be to uh, providing financial support to local farmers who may need some assistance to adapt, uh, adopt these practices. Oh, thanks very much, Andy. Yeah, appreciate the question, uh, Anonymous. <laughs> uh, I mentioned earlier our relationship with the soil and water conservation districts and uh, that important part, how important that partnership really is with them because they really are the conduit uh, for our grant programs and for our AIM program, climate resiliency programs, et cetera. So, I think uh, currently we have over 12,000 farms that are already participating with our AIM plan, our Agriculture Environmental Management Program. And, and then, in fact, we've made that the cornerstone of New York State's uh, marketing program for agricultural products. Our New York Rona Certified Program uh, requires that you uh, have AIM certification. So I think this is uh, through those programs, that's how we can uh, stimulate soil health thinking, uh, on-farm planning, how to make a farm, as was mentioned in the films there about uh, making the farm more efficient in regards to uh, nutrient management, environmental footprint. So I think uh, that's the way the financial support gets to the farmers. We have over 52 of our soil and water conservation districts around the state that can you know, help that farmer find the, the technical expertise, but also the financial support to continue that work. Thank you very much, Commissioner. And I just want to recognize that um, uh, several of the farmers who have been participating in the carbon farming pilot, uh, Sarah Chase and Travis uh, Ferry, have joined us here on the panel. So thank you to both of you for making time out of your day. We know it's a busy time of year and really appreciate you uh, popping onto our, our webinar to share your expertise. Uh, the next question that we've received um, is, do, does anyone on the panel have thoughts about what barriers real or perceived farmers have in assess, accessing technical and financial assistance to implement 
conservation practices? And how can we remove these barriers to improve or increase adoption and participation in programs? Uh, so Sarah, Travis, I think if it's okay with you, I'd like to direct this one to you since you're on the front lines of working with the state and our soil and water conservation districts to access various programs that are available. Think you're on um, yeah i i mean in my case both of the practices that i'm implementing at chase home are i make round bales already so for bale grazing it's just the way that we are you know moving the cows through the field um, utilizing electric fencing which is a you know has a cost if a farm isn't already using that but it is a fairly low cost um, and it actually could be, it's one of those things um, that could really help a farm be making, you know, carbon smart farming practices year round, not just in like the, with this particular study we're doing, you know, the bale grazing and, and these like seeding um, measures. But yeah, I mean, it's really, I think in large part, it's like about changing the way that you think about the farm um, to try to get, you know, to create profitability, um, you know, I guess like instead of always think about ways you can maximize what you already have um, using like without huge investment. And that's, I mean, just being like cost effective is what um, using small like poly wire fencing has helped Chase Home do anyway. Um, so yeah, I guess like making it sound like it's something that can help your bottom line that makes you like more efficient overall. It's a good way to think about it, help farmers think about it. Yeah, that's really great. How about you, Travis? Anything to add there? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, cost, um, making sure that, you know, realizing something you're doing in the off season uh, that maybe doesn't, you know, pay dividends immediately, you know, will pay off in the future. And then just, you know, making time to uh, make sure you can get, you know, cover crops and things in. Um, you know, that's something that Russ mentioned in the video, uh, you know, it's something that he just makes, you know, certain that he has time, he has the seed on hand for when he gets uh, his main crop off the field. And, you know, he just makes certain to make time for that every year. So that way, you know, he has that protection and that increase in soil health every year. Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, Ned, we've got a couple questions for you. Um, I'll see if I can kind of combine them here for efficiency's sake. Uh, the first is, you know, how do we expand climate friendly farming to other parts of the Hudson Valley and other Northeastern states, building on the success of the Northeast Carbon Alliance to date? You know, for example, uh, the uh, questioner asked, could we envision a regional climate friendly collaborative of some sort involving multiple states and multiple counties? Would you like to comment on that? Sure. Uh, thanks, Andy. And, and I think that's, that is what the Northeast Carbon Alliance is. It's a collection of uh, research farms, uh, uh, scientists from, from our leading uh, research institutes, and in, not just in, in the Hudson Valley, but, but in New Jersey and Massachusetts. Um, and, you know, I think what you've heard about from Commissioner Ball and uh, Brian, uh, is uh, the state's effort on this front. And we are seeking to partner with the state and other uh, commissioners of agriculture in the Northeastern states. And uh, we've had a series of uh, meetings and, and webinars uh, that are bringing people together from all over the Northeast, sharing practices and ultimately um, truth testing the practices that are being implemented, building a common database of the impact of, of those uh, regenerative and adaptive practices on soil health um, and carbon sequestration so that that can be shared with uh, the working farmers uh, who are seeking to improve their yields and profitability and uh, have uh, good markets for their products. So uh, I think we're we're on the on the road there, and uh, the kind of collaboration that we're seeing today, and uh, seeing the farmers, uh, like Sarah and Travis, uh, you know, really on the land implementing these and sharing, 
uh, are absolutely crucial. And Scenic Hudson is going to be working to create uh, regenerative agriculture demonstration areas in two subregions of, of the Hudson Valley, where we are working with uh, our existing farmers, the partners through easements, but new farmers that want to work with us, preserve their land and implement regenerative practices and uh, providing resources to them, but also bringing them together with farmers uh, who, are, who are implementing these because we know that they have the greatest credibility, they're doing it, and we wanna be there to, to support them and give them opportunities to share their learning. Thanks so much, Ned. Uh, just one other quick note, my apologies. Um, Travis, I uh, introduced you wrong. You are actually with the uh, Orange County Soil and Water Conservation District. So just to clarify that for our audience uh, today, and thank you again for being here. Um, so the next question would be to our Soil and Water Conservation District partners, Brian and Travis. And um, the question is, what will we do with the data from this pilot study and how can we be using it and organizing it to make sure that it directly benefits farmers? All right, thank you, Amy. Um, so as, as a follow-up to this um, uh, information that we're receiving, um, the, the the aim process is ongoing relationship between the producer and their their provider, in this case, soil and water conservation districts. So we will be using the baseline data to to find out where the farm, so to speak, started at um, following through with the um, uh, the post implementation uh, soils health analysis that will be used to, you know, uh, start to see where those uh, those practices have improved the, the soil condition um, where the farmer can um, continue to make decisions about the rest of their operation, as well as in the grander picture um, with some of these new collaboratives that are being established, we can start to, you know, identify those practices that do the most good in the, re in the region for those farm types and for those situations that can, um, be uh, promoted on other operations. So that's kind of where we see this uh, pilot project taking uh, legs into other um, uh, collaboratives, other situations in the region and onto other farms. Thanks, Brian. Uh, so Sarah, let's jump to another question to you. And if you could maybe comment a little bit on uh, what your farm uh, was like before you started putting in some of these climate resilient practices, you know, what it's like now, and is there any, um, you know, particular challenge uh, that you've um, tried to engage with when addressing, you know, these practices on your farm? Sarah, are you with us? I am, sorry. I think my computer froze up for a second. Um, particular challenges. I mean, yeah, one is the no-till cedar that um, I, I do not own one and I've been renting one, but um, they've become quite popular for folks in the area. And so it was a little, I had a hard time accessing one this year. So that was, um, you know, a little challenge. Um, yeah, but yeah, I also like, you know, you can, you can like solve those problems. The farmers are used to that kind of thing. You can um, innovate on the go and that's fine too. Uh, we ended up spin seeding everything on and having the cows trample it in. Um, they sit that week and we got them, so it, it all turned out well and good timing, but um, yeah, I mean, there is, it takes a fair bit of labor to also like this, the bale grazing thing that we've been doing it just like stocking everything early in the season, um, which I mean, it just, just takes time and planning, but um, I think it's worth it <laughs> in the long run. Great, thank you. And uh, Commissioner Ball, a, a question to you. I think you have a, a very unique perspective here as somebody who 
uh, is a farmer, long tradition of farming in your family, um, a lot of experience doing that before you came into state government and are now overseeing uh, policy development and implementation of various programs. From where you sit, um, you know, what do you think are the, the most important things we need to be doing to uh, create um, stronger flow of information between policymakers, between farmers, uh, to really uh, get more practices like we're talking about today happening on the ground? Well, thanks for that. That's kind of a that's kind of a big, uh, broad target there that you gave to me. So, uh, yeah, thanks. I think uh, this is one example of that. You know, we need to communicate more. We need to uh, get the word out. I I will say I feel like we're pretty well along in that. Frankly, we're dealing with climate uh, every day. It's touching everyone. Uh, the climate. Uh, efforts across the country and here in New York State are certainly resonating with everyone. You can't hide from this subject anymore. And I think broadly, I, you know, you mentioned uh, my family and the tradition. I appreciate that. We've learned a lot over the years. Um, and we just need to be smart about what we've learned, I think, now. So the word sustainability was thrown around for many years. And I, I know all the farmers that we've listened to today care very deeply about that. I do on my farm. I left my farm this morning and I think about the next generation, but I think about leaving that farm in a better way for the next generation than, uh, than it's been. So I think about my grandfather a lot. I think about the way he farmed. I think the practices that were common then that he employed. Um, and so much of it was based on tradition and so much of it was based on gut feelings. He'd do things that uh, he'd reach into the ground and just say, this feels good, this feels better, the tilth is better after I did this practice. Well, today, and I'm looking at Brian here and I'm looking at our soil and water conservation districts broadly and our researchers at Cornell and the efforts of this project, we can quantify that. It's not just a gut feeling anymore, we can actually say, this is improving the nutrients on my farm. This is leaving things better. This is making me more efficient. My grandfather was not thinking about carbon at all. Uh, we, we can think about carbon today. So I think uh, the effort in the ag and forestry work panel, I think of the efforts broadly on climate, the efforts that I see coming down the pike uh, are really helping uh, the farmers of today uh, take it to another level. I have to say, I go to uh, vegetable grower conferences and apple grower conferences and organic farming conferences and the most passionate meeting session in all those conferences is surrounding soil health. The room is packed. Uh, so I think between our, our conversations today, the conversations that are happening around our organizations and our commodity groups they're all channeling, channeling, channeling what we're, we're talking about today. And I think uh, at the department, we're just gonna work to try to facilitate that and make that an everyday thing and a common course of action. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, another question for our SWCD partners, uh, Brian and Travis, uh, take it as you will. Uh, but, you know, in the course of this pilot study, there's a lot of um, communication that's taking place with farmers on the ground to kind of monitor the activities that are under the study. Uh, this has been something that's been discussed about at a, a policy level. If the state or federal government were to move forward with providing, you know, more incentives uh, in some shape or form to farmers to implement these practices, uh, what would your advice be for uh, the best way to kind of monitor that activity and report on that data uh, in a way that is, is efficient, but also can ensure that um, public investments are uh, going in the right direction and actually getting the results that uh, people are interested in having them achieve? Uh, that's a that's pretty tough, tough one to to uh, quantify, um, it's uh, it's not an easy task when you think about you know tying these practices directly to um, carbon and directly to monetary incentives. 
uh, it makes it really difficult to um, kind of wrap your arms around that. Uh, the, the simple answer would be something clean and neat, but as has been identified um, by the commissioner specifically, you know, we, we don't have the similar uh, ag activities here in the Valley, particularly that other parts of the state and the world have. So that's a pretty unique situation. Um, I think that, uh, you know, some mm -hmm. of the uh, questions really come down to um, figuring out a little more of the soil's health matrix, what that really looks like before we can even really enter into that conversation of incentivizing it for a, uh, um, a carbon type of uh, um, equivalent or what have you. Uh, it makes it really difficult. Um, I think the path that we're on incentivizing uh, the implementation of practices based on uh, the farm need and the, the goals of the producer and the best efficient ways to farm, particularly here in the Hudson Valley and then across the state are the means that are gonna get us the most buy-in at this point. And um, possibly over time, those carbon markets can be developed, but that's a really, really tough task. Great, well, thank you for that. Sounds like you've laid out a great framework for how we can all be thinking about that. And I'll, I'll follow up one tough question with another one. Um, uh, which is in the uh, Q&A coming um, from a participant in today's program regarding how we can be handling the tensions that emerge when we think about uh, regenerative and soil health practices on one hand, and then you know, the targeted use of pesticides or fertilizer on another hand. And you know, is there a conflict there that exists between those two goals? Are there ways that we can be thinking about that where they're integrated? Um, could, I know this is a tough question and probably has about as many different answers as there are panelists on the, um, the call today, but I want to throw this one out to all of you. And if there's any comment on how we can be thinking about this relationship between regenerative practices and then some of the more chemical intensive practices that are used by some farmers. Anyone want to take a crack at that? Uh, sure, I'll, uh, I'll just make an observation if you don't mind. I, I remember when I was uh, a young man uh, starting to farm, I was 18. And uh, I remember then, you know, there was a pretty strong tension between a relatively small organic community and a relatively large, you know, what we'll call traditional conventional community in ag. And we were about 180 degrees apart at that time. Didn't really talk to each other about anything. And I have to say, I'm, I'm old enough to say that, uh, you know, today um, I see the same faces when I go to an, a NOFA conference and when I go to a vegetable conference in the soil health room, I see the same folks. Uh, and I would say that uh, I'm thinking about the way we grew potatoes you know, back in the 70s and 80s and the way I grow potatoes today, uh, it's very different. Um, understanding the pest, being smart, using the, uh, the knowledge we've learned over the years. And, uh, uh, you know, the, no longer are the organic community and conventional community, I think, 180 degrees apart. I think we're in the same room. And then I think that the more we experiment with, the more that we understand and trust the use of cover crops to not only sequester carbons, but also to keep the nutrients in that soil bank where we want them, uh, then we become better farmers, better growers, and take advantage of what our grandparents knew, take advantage of what we learned in science uh, about those things. And I think we become you know, a little bit closer together. So I have to say, I, I don't know exactly how to ease those tensions, they're there, but I think uh, the more we look at uh, the outcome and the product, uh, and we have a good excuse now to look at everything a little differently as we deal with climate change. Uh, we can be smarter about this. We've learned a lot. We can quantify a lot more. I think that brings us together. I'm very optimistic that 
you know, a farmer who looks at the economics, a farmer that looks at the soil quality, uh, we're going to be heading down a parallel path and getting closer as we do that. Thank you, Commissioner. Another question is uh, come in on the uh, Q&A. Um, the question is, well, the focus is on the carbon side um, of the equation. Is the project uh, that we're talking about today also looking at the methane side of the equation? Um, so Brian, this might be a good one to kick back to you just to um, describe what the scope is of this effort um, so the, uh, everyone can understand that. Um, so uh, the focus here is predominantly on the carbon, um, the carbon side of things. Um, there are inherent um, relationships with the uh, greenhouse gases and the quantification of that as you do some of the soil's health analyses. So we are seeing some relationships there, but uh, really this one has been focused on um, the carbon predominantly. So, um, you know, I guess maybe that'll be something to take off with uh, another type of project down the road as we, again, develop more um, material and um, information out of these type of practices. Thanks, Brian. And uh, one final question, I think, before we, we wrap up here and come up in time at 11 o'clock, and I'll um, send this one to um, both Sarah, but also ask Ned to address the, the other side of it. And uh, Sarah, we'll start with you. The question is, you know, what has been your experience working with your uh, local SWCD um, and any land trust that you've worked with? And would you give any advice to farmers um, for uh, you know, developing and maintaining these relationships? And yeah, I think it'd be interesting to hear after you, you make a comment also from Ned about you know, the other side, from the nonprofit perspective, if there's things, um, Ned, that Suna Cutson has learned about how to work with and collaborate with the agricultural community on, on issues of shared interest. So Sarah, let's um, start with you. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think, you know, right when I started farming in 2013, I reached out to Soil and Water um, to like start, um, you know, you have to like, you know, the base layer stuff, like making a um, grazing plan. And, and, you know, I worked with them from the get-go and I actually, my timing starting farming coincided with the start of some of the staff there. And it's been, you know, I think that in the beginning I had like, I had so much to learn and um, I was still developing like the type of interests that I, that I have and like what, what direction my farm would take and what kind of like, yeah practices I would really want to focus on. But the advantage of starting early uh, with soil and water was that we, we you know, the, the staff and I sort of got to know each other well along the way and, and both, you know, the program development, like learning how the programs work there, as well as, yeah, just sort of like being on a parallel track where they understood my interests and my, the practices that I'm interested, you know, the, where our overlap might be and how we could, um, yeah, work together in the most, in the best way, which has, I really appreciated that, like, like just actual, like people, um, yeah, this like actual relationship across the, um, from the farm to the, knowing, like knowing that when they're like reading, you know, grants or type of programs that they're developing, like they might like think of me as they're, as they're reading it and uh, know that I would be interested or or not but that kind of just like getting to know each other over time and I think yeah just like making contact for farmers um getting in touch and and you know and not only trying to like conform to what programs they're doing but letting them know what what you are actually interested in what gets you excited what kind of practices you think are really cool and because in some cases you know from the state perspective, they're going to be moving more slow in some sort of conservation practices, just by nature of like bureaucracy, right? So if you're the type of farmer who's got like big um, plans, I guess, um, being able to like communicate about them so that everyone can get on the same page. 
Great, thanks so much. And Ned, just wondering if you'd like to add anything uh, to kind of wrap up comments and, and talk about you know the role that nonprofits can play uh, really as part of this um, overall discussion. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks Andy, and, and thanks to all for for participating in today's program. I've, <clears throat> I've learned a lot. Um, I is an environmental advocacy organization and a land trust, and we have been working with farmers to preserve uh, their land for some 25 years. And we've always taken the approach that we are not farmers and we don't want to uh, presume to, to tell them how, how to farm. Our, our mission is to protect the land and the uh, soils and uh, the other natural resource areas on, on the farms. But we, we see an opportunity uh, now uh, to be a convener as we're doing today with, with other co-sponsors of this event and to try to bring together the experienced farmers who are pioneering uh, these adaptive practices and um, ensure that, that they can learn and to try to work with the soil and water conservation districts to support them and to learn from this pilot how um, the existing state programs and new ones that may emerge from the Climate Action Council uh, may be able to further support them. So we wanna be a voice for the farmers in Albany and in Washington, DC and in these regional conversations. And so, uh, you know, we're always here to learn um, and to convene and to um, try to uh, be helpful in supporting the farmers in particularly those who want to make the shift to adaptive and regenerative practices and to help bring the resources to bear. And so I think that is true of other not-for-profits that are part of the Northeast Carbon Alliance and that are working with us in Albany to, to support uh, uh, the efforts of, of the Climate Action Council and to forge ahead with new legislation like the soil health bill that we, we do hope uh, Governor Hochul will soon be, be signing. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ned. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, thank you, Brian, Travis, and Sarah um, for all of your great input today and uh, fielding some of these questions. Uh, and to our participants, um, observers of today's webinar, thank you so much for your participation. I've dropped a link into the chat for the Northeast Carbon Alliance, where we will be posting a recorded uh, version of this webinar at some point in the near future. So please feel free to check back, uh, share it, and uh, stay tuned for a further update on the uh, study, hopefully coming sometime in, in 2022. Thank you.